worship of Saturn. Saturn, so active in cosmic changes, was regarded by all mankind as the supreme god. Seneca says that Epigenes, who studied astronomy among the Chaldeans, estimates that the planet Saturn exerts the greatest influence upon all the movements of the celestial bodies. On becoming a nova, it ejected filaments in all directions, and the solar system became illuminated as if by a hundred suns. It subsided rather quickly and retreated into faraway regions. Peoples that remembered early tragedies enacted in the sky by the heavenly bodies asserted that Jupiter drove Saturn away from its place in the sky. Before Jupiter, Zeus became the chief god. Saturn, Kronos, occupied the celestial throne. In all ancient religions, the dominion passes from Saturn to Jupiter. In Greek mythology, Kronos is presented as the father and Zeus as his son, who dethrones him. Kronos devours some of his children. After this act, Zeus overpowers his father, puts him in chains, and drives him from his royal station in the sky. If Egyptian folklore or religion, the participants of the drama are said to be Osiris Saturn, brother and husband of Isis Jupiter. The cult of Osiris and the mysteries associated with it dominated the Egyptian religion as nothing else. Every dead man or woman was entombed with observances honoring Osiris. The city of Abydos in the desert west of the Nile and northwest of Thebes was sacred to him. Sais in the delta, used to commemorate the floating of Osiris' body carried by the Nile into the Mediterranean, what made Osiris so deeply ingrained in the religious memory of the nation that his cult pervaded mythology and religion. Osiris' dominion before his murder by Seth was remembered as a time of bliss. According to the legend, Seth, Osiris' brother, killed and dismembered him. Whereupon Isis, Osiris' wife, went on peregrinations, peregrinations to collect his dispersed members. Having gathered them and wrapped them together with swathings, she brought Osiris back to life. The memory of this event was a matter of yearly jubilation among the Egyptians. Osiris became lord of the netherworld and land of the dead. The land of the dead, a legend, a prominent part of the Osiris cycle tells that Isis gave birth to Horus, whom she conceived from the already dead Osiris, and that Horus grew up to avenge his father by engaging Seth in mortal combat. In Egyptology, the meaning of these occurrences stands as an unresolved mystery. The myth of Osiris is too remarkable and occurs in too many divergent forms not to contain a considerable element of historic truth, wrote Sir Alan Gardner, the leading scholar in these fields. But what historical truth is it? Could it be of an ancient king upon whose tragic death the entire legend hinged, wondered Gardner. But of such a king, not a trace has been found before the time of the pyramid texts. And in these texts, Osiris is spoken of without end. There he appears as a dead god or king or judge of the dead. But who was Osiris in real life? asked Gardner. At times, he is represented to us as the vegetation which perishes in the floodwater mysteriously issuing from himself. He is associated with brilliant light. After the life, of studying Egyptian history and religion, Gardner confessed that he remained unaware of whom Osiris represented or memorialized. The origin of Osiris remains for me as insoluble mystery, nor could others in this field help him find the answer. The Egyptologist John Wilson wrote that it is an admission of failure that the chief cultural content of Egyptian civilization its religion, its mythological features, 
again and again narrated and alluded to in the text and represented in statues and temple reliefs is not understood. The astral meaning of Egyptian deities was not realized and the cosmic events of their activities represent were not thought of. The prophet Ezekiel in the Babylon exile had a vision, the likeness of a man, but made of fire and amber who lifted him by the lock of his hair and brought him to some darkened chamber where the ancients of the house of Israel with censers in their hands were worshiping idols portrayed upon the wall round about. Then the angel of the vision told him, Thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. And he brought the prophet to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Next he showed him also Jews in the inner court of the Lord's house, with their back toward the temple of the Lord, and their faces toward the east, that they worshipped the sun toward the east. The worship of the sun and the planets was decried by Jeremiah, a contemporary of Ezekiel. But what was this weeping for Tammuz? Tammuz was a Babylonian god. One of the months of the year, approximately coinciding with July, in the summer, was named in his honor. And by this very name, it is known in the present day Hebrew calendar, Tammuz was the god that died and was then hidden in the underworld. His death was the reason for a fast, accompanied by lamentations of the women of the land. His finding or his return to life and resurrection were the motifs of the passion. Tammuz was the god of vegetation, of the flood, and of seeds. The god Tammuz came from Armenia every year in his ark in the overflowing river, blessing the alluvium with new growth. In the month of Tammuz he was bound, and the liturgies speak of his having been drowned among flowers which were thrown upon him as he sank beneath the waves of the Euphrates. The drowning of Tammuz was an occasion for wailing by women. The flood has taken Tammuz, the raging storm has brought him low of Tammuz. It is also narrated that he was associated with brilliant light, with descent into the netherworld, visited by Ishtar, his spouse. Tammuz's death, his subsequent resurrection, or his discovery in the far reaches, but no longer brilliant, were the themes of the cult that was not just one of the mysteries, but the chief and paramount cult. The Osirian Mysteries, the Wailing for Tammuz, all refer to the transformation of Saturn during and following the Deluge. Osiris was not a king, but the planet Saturn, Kronos of the Greeks, Tammuz of the Babylonians. The Babylonians called Saturn the Star of Tammuz. After the Deluge, Saturn was invisible. The sky was covered for a long time by clouds of volcanic dust. And the Egyptians cried for Osiris and the Babylonians cried for Tammuz. Isis, Jupiter at that time, went in search of her husband, and Ishtar, also Jupiter at that early time, went to the netherworld to find her husband Tammuz. For a time Saturn disappeared, driven away by Jupiter, and when it reappeared, it was no longer the same planet. It moved very slowly. The disappearance of the planet Saturn in the netherworld became the theme of many religious observances, compromising liturgies, mystery plays, lamentations, and fasts. When Osiris was seen again in the sky, though greatly diminished, the people were frenzied by the return of Osiris from death. Nevertheless, he became king of the netherworld. In the Egyptian way of seeing the celestial drama, Isis, Jupiter, the spouse of Osiris, Saturn, wrapped him in swathings. Osiris was known as the Swath, the way the dead came to be dressed for their journey to the world of the dead, over which Osiris reigns. Similar rites were celebrated in honor of Adonis, who died and was resurrected after a stay in the Netherland, in the mysteries of Orpheus. Sir James G. Fraser, a collector of folklore, came to regard Osiris as a vegetation god, 
Likewise, he saw in the Babylonian Tammuz an equivalent of the Egyptian Osiris, a vegetation god, and carried away by this concept, wrote his, the golden bow, built around the idea of the vegetation god that dies and is resurrected the following year. A few peoples, through consecutive planetary ages, kept fidelity to the ancient Saturn, or Kronos, or Brahma, whose age was previous to that of Jupiter. Thus the Scythians were called Uman Manda by the Chaldeans, people of Manda, and Manda is the name of Saturn. The Phoenicians regarded El Saturn as their chief deity. Isubius informs us that El, a name used also in the Bible as a name for God, was the name of Saturn. In Persia, he was known as Kavan or Kavan. The different names for God in the Bible reflect the process of going through many ages in which one planet superseded another and was again superseded by the next one in the celestial war. El was the name of Saturn, Adonis of the Syrians. The Bewail deity was also like Osiris, the planet Saturn. But in the period of the contest between the two major planets, Jupiter and Saturn, the appellative of the dual gods became Adonai, which means my lords. Then, with the victory of Jupiter, it came to be applied to him alone. Emmanuel Velikovsky Velikovsky's Comet, Part 2, Venus, Smoking Star. In arguing for the cometary character of Venus, Velikovsky cited Aztec records, suggesting that the planet Venus shared the same title given the comet. The early traditions of peoples of Mexico, written down in pre-Columbian days, relate that Venus smoked, the star that smoked. When Estrella Q. Humeva was Sitlal Cholula, which the Spaniards called Venus. Now I ask, says Alexander Humboldt, what optical illusion could give Venus the appearance of a star throwing out smoke? Sahagin, the 16th century Spanish authority in Mexico, wrote that the Mexicans called a comet a star that smoked. It may thus be concluded that since the Mexicans called Venus a star that smoked, they considered it a comet. In Bob Forrest's mind, the Aztec references could have nothing to do with what may or may not have happened back in the mid-2nd millennium BC, because the references to Venus smoking came from the 16th century AD. In a number of instances, Aztec records say that Earth shook and the star Sitlau Koloha, Venus, smoked. To account for the curiosity, Forrest simply accepts the guest of Alexander Humboldt, who suggested that the smoke related to the volcano Orizaba, situated to the east of the city Kalula, and whose glow, when seen in the distance, resembled or was symbolically related to the rising morning star. Forrest was apparently satisfied with the first guess he uncovered. All we have are some 16th century records which say, every so often, that the star smoked. But since the smoking seems frequently to be intertwined with earthquake activity, Humboldt's assumption seems reasonable. With that stated, Forrest moved on, never returning to the issue of the Aztec smoking star. A quite different approach would have been to explore the possibility of a broader Venus Comet Association, to see where the available evidence leads. Guided by this intent, Forrest would have quickly found, for example, that Aztec association of earthquake activity with smoking stars belonged to the general mythology of the comet among the Aztecs. Thus, with respect to the comets portrayed in the Codex Vaticanus and Codex Telereno Remensis, the respected authority on Mexican astronomy, Anthony Avini, writes 
Comets are represented frequently by surviving historical documents, usually by a stellar image on a blue background with emanating streams of smoke. These usually signify that a person of nobility will die. For example, one picture of the death of the ruler Tenochtitlan followed the apparition of a comet. Later, another comet occurs, then an earthquake, all of nature's events being connected in the Aztec cosmic view. As I hope to demonstrate fully in this series of articles, the connectedness of these images derives from a universal substratum of myth, appearance of a comet, death of a great ruler, quaking earth, not in Mexico alone, but in one ancient culture after another. The sky watchers repeatedly placed these unusual themes in juxtaposition. Despite this crucial fact, no comet observed by science has ever justified the symbolic connection. But Forrest seems unaware that the language employed in astrological texts and omens is drawn from ancient mythical images. Following his mythological ground rules, therefore, no records of portents in the sky recorded in the last three millennia would be of any relevance to Velikovsky's argument. Even when repeatedly attached explicit cometary images to Venus, with respect to the image of the planet Venus as the smoking star in the Codex Teleriano Remensis, if any, offers his own attempt at an explanation. Perhaps a cometary object appeared near the planet. Of course, Forrest could just as easily have cited this guess, then dropped the whole issue. But is there something more worth investigating here? Throughout the Americas, including Mexico, natives called a comet the star with hair, or long-haired star, or main star, an appellation that fits comfortably with the global language of the comet. In fact, the long-haired star is the single most common phrase for the comet around the world, and our own word for comet comes from the Greek kamets, the long-haired star. The Yucatec Maya dictionaries give a gloss for smoke star or main star. But curiously, the Aztecs used this very language for Venus. As noted by Velikovsky, they called the planet Zante Mach, meaning the main star, or long-haired star, and not the Aztecs alone. For one finds among the Maya the same enigmatic association of planet Venus with long flowing hair. A commonly observed Maya hieroglyph is the Cobbin Curl, a flowing tassel or lock of hair repeatedly attached to acknowledged Venus systems, including the glyph name of Venus itself. To encounter the long flowing locks of Venus, one need only consult available sources. Turn to the Incan language of Venus, for example. I can remember in the first few days of investigating images of Venus, looking through a standard summary of Incan mythology and encountering the name of Venus as Chasca, translated as long-haired star, a precise phrase for the comet in the global lexicon. It was instances such as this that continued to fuel my own interest in learning more. According to William Prescott, Venus was known to the Peruvians by the name of Chasca, or youth with long curling locks. Burr Cartwright Brandage tells us that among the Inca, Venus was the radiant star with flowing hair, the morning star. Chaska, the disheveled one, dispensed stories of freshness and loveliness upon flowers, princesses and virgins below. She was the deity of the rosy cloud rack of morning, and when she shook out her long hair, she scattered the dew upon the earth. The point here is that Forrest's explanation of the Aztec Venus smoking star association fails to acknowledge converging lines of evidence. Aztec Comet as Smoking Star, Aztec Venus as Smoking Star, Aztec and Mayan Long-Haired Star as Comet, Aztec Venus as Long-Haired Star, Mayan Venus with or as Flowing Lock or Tassel, 
inconvenient as long-haired star. Hence, the methodological issue is placed in sharp relief. Here is another way of looking at the issue logically. Around the world, there are only a small number of pre-astronomical hieroglyphs for the comet. You could, in fact, count the primary glyphs on the fingers of one hand. Heart, soul of a deceased god-king or great leader rising in the sky. Long-haired star, star with flowing locks, mane, tresses, disheveled hair, beard, hairy tail, torch star, ember, flame, smoke, smoking star, train of fire, spark or train of sparks, celestial feather, winged star, soul bird, bright feathers, feathered headdress, shining bird's tail, cosmic serpent, dragon, or similar monster. The remaining general hieroglyphs for the comet could be counted on the fingers of your second hand. They include a sword, a bundle of grass or straw, whisk broom, or a spiraled rope, cord, tie, or knot. At what point, then, does a coincidence or seemingly irrational use of language, comet words or glyphs attached to Venus, become an anomaly worth pursuing? Forrest not only sidesteps the implications of parallel cometry, eight images of Venus in other lands, he ignores the convergence of such images in Mexico as the methodology, the approach is disastrous because there is much, much more. And next we have Quetzalcoatl. In the popular Aztec myth of Quetzalcoatl, the Venus comet anomaly grows by leaps and bounds. And in this case, the completeness of the cometary motifs leaves no room for ad hoc explanations. Whether remembered by the Aztecs as a former great king and founder of the Golden Age, or a former sun god ruling a primordial epoch, Quetzalcoatl was a cultural hero without equal in the Aztec pantheon. His continuance adorning temple walls and the stucco bases of pyramids, painted on countless frescoes and codices, and engraved on sarcophagi and monoliths strewn across Mexico. The climatic event in the Quetzalcoatl myth is the god's catastrophic death and transformation in an overwhelming disaster, an event endlessly repeated in sacrificial rites and supplying the cornerstone of Aztec calendar rituals and astronomical symbolism. In a pervasive version of the myth, at the death of Quetzalcoatl, the god's heart and soul, <clears throat> the god's heart or soul grows in the sky as a great spark or ember trailing smoke and fire, a star whose fiery train the Aztecs portrayed as the streaming tail of the Quetzalbert. Was this flaming star a comet? One notes that the Quiche Maya called the comet Uji Chumal, tail of the star, and the Aztec artists often draw comets as stars with Quetzal tails, the bright and luminous plumes of the Quetzal providing a particularly well-suited hieroglyph for a comet. The symbolism accords well with that of other peoples. The Pawnee gave to the comet the name Pericus Kuka, feathered headdress, an appellation that proves telling see later discussion of the plumed headdress in our next installment. In Africa, the streaming comet's tail was identified as the feathers of the night jar, and the natives say of a comet, it is wearing streaming feathers. Astronomer Carl Sagan or as well would say Carl Sagan, in his review of worldwide comet motifs, notes that comets are called tail stars and st stars with long feathers. Germanic races called a comet the peacock's tail, while in China a comet was seen as both a peacock's tail and a pheasant's tail. Isn't it amazing how it seems like everything that we know comes from Saturn theory. It's just embarrassingly rich with evidence. The Quetzalcoatl's flaming or plumed heart soul meant a comet-like star that is substantiated by converging lines of evidence. Its cometary character, for example, would agree with a general tradition among the Aztecs that comets were the ascending souls of great chiefs. The Quetzalcoatl was the model of the good king gives perfect sense to the symbolic motif. 
The Quetzalcoatl was also the prototype of the Aztec shaman. That is, he was the celestial figure whose biography provided the general myth and symbolism of the shaman. It is thus worth noting that in South American lore, the soul of a shaman was believed to depart in the form of a comet. Noteworthy is the fact that a comet appearing sometime prior to the conquest of the Aztecs by Cortez was reckoned as a positive sign that Quetzalcoatl would eventually return to Mexico. To suggest that the heart and soul of Quetzalcoatl rose as a comet is simply to place the Aztec symbolism alongside a universal tradition. Cultures around the world proclaim the comet to be the soul of a dying king. Thus, we have listed this significant theme as number one in our short list of comet symbols above. But there is a problem here. While several variations on the story of Quetzalcoatl's death may have been preserved, one of the central elements is the identification of the heart soul as the planet Venus. Burr Cartwright Brundage gives this summary. The god's heart, like a great spark, flies up to become new and splendid divinity. The morning star, thus, a narrative source declares, then the heart of Quetzalcoatl rose into the heaven and according to the elders, was transformed into the morning star, and Quetzalcoatl was called the Lord of Dawn. We shall have more to say about this transformation. The fact at hand is that in their myths and rites, the Aztecs say the separated heart soul of Quetzalcoatl. Say the separated heart soul of Quetzalcoatl, following a period of darkened sky and upheaval, rose as the planet Venus. If the story has roots in any celestial occurrence, as explicitly claimed in the myths, the death of Quetzalcoatl must have accompanied something of an unprecedented scale. For no mythical historical event left a deeper impression on the Aztec thought and culture. Upon this traumatic episode, the Aztecs evolved their collective sense of cyclical time, including a calendar of world ages. The death of Quetzalcoatl, the onset of celestial confusion, and the transformation of his heart-soul into the planet Venus meant nothing less than the end of one world age and the beginning of another. David Talbot